So uh, first off, um, what day is it? It's, fr it's Friday, right? And are we Rubyists? Yes. What do Rubyists do on Friday? Deploy. <laughs> right, besides deploy. We do, we do uh, Friday hugs, don't we? And we haven't done a Friday hug. So I would like to do a Friday hug if we could get everybody to do that. That's important. Love and all that. Probably some smokers that still aren't back yet, but that's all right. You know, they don't have any love. I don't know. You guys are, are apparently, this is a huge place. All right, can we get a hug? All right, every, you want to stand? Stand, stand. Everybody get enthusiastic about this hug. All right, ready? Three, two, one. Got it. All right, I'll tweet that later. That was, that was very, very nice. Oh, you, you guys look, you wait until you see yourself. You're beautiful, all of you. All right, so I want to talk to you about the most important optimization, happiness. And I want to make sure that this fancy clicker, you see, I'm a pro. I have the Logitech Pro clicker here, so you can tell I'm really an old hat at this. Not really. All right, so first off, how many of you all are happy right now? Yeah? Pretty happy? Is it just because you're at Big RubyConf, or are you just happy in general? And do you know it is the other question, because if you do, you know what's next, right? Oh, nice! Awesome! All right, so you started off the day with clapping, and now I've, I've actually tricked you into both hugging me and giving me applause early, so, so that's really awesome. Thank you. So I'm with Living Social. I live socially. If you would like to live socially with me, uh, we can chat afterwards. I'm going to hang around till uh, tomorrow morning. We're hiring. So I wanted to ask you guys, I mean, I have some really good news. My New Year's resolution is going phenomenally right now because my New Year's resolution was to speak, and I think I'm doing that right now. So now I've got basically 10 months, I guess, to screw around. I don't have to do anything. I've success already. The, uh, the bad news about that is uh, this is my first time ever giving a full-length talk. So uh, there is a not negligible chance that things could go wrong in a spectacularly horrible fashion. And uh, well, I guess that could be interesting too, I suppose. Um, so I've been a little bit nervous about this talk, actually. And it's not because I don't have something to say. I, I feel like I could probably talk to you without these slides, but I'm going to stick with them anyway. But when I started working on the slides, I called my folks and I was reminded of one very important thing. Apparently, I have one fan <laughs> and uh, she, I, I, I'm not sure about my mom, the way that she gives compliments. You're interesting to listen to. You shouldn't worry, you're interesting to listen. She didn't say, you're a good speaker. She said, you're interesting to listen to and I'm not sure, I'm not entirely sure how to take that. <laughs> I hope she's right. Um, so you might be asking, is this really necessary? Is this talk really necessary? And I, I sure hope so, because otherwise I'm about to waste 40 minutes of your lives. But I would say that it's a reasonable question to ask, because people kind of naturally seem to think, you know, they have happiness kind of under control. Right? They take stock of their lives. They say, yeah, I've got a pretty decent life. I'm pretty happy. And we kind of think we naturally do the things that make us happy. And I don't know. For me personally, I guess I have to tell a story, really, to explain this. So this is me at five years old. My parents got an Atari 2600 for us, which rocked, which dates me as well. And I loved, I mean, it was love at first sight. I mean, to tell you how much I love this thing, you might see that I'm playing what's arguably the absolutely worst Atari 2600 game of all time, E.T. <laughs> I am wearing my lucky E.T. shirt. And, uh, and I'm in really, really engrossed in it. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure how, how it required that much concentration to play, but apparently it's really hard stuff. So about, about a year later, uh, my parents brought home one of these. And you, yeah, you know, right? Pretty awesome. Coco 2s. Um, the thing about the Color Computer 2 that I think is most awesome, actually, is the, uh, the placement of the arrow keys, which is really in very intuitive places on opposite sides of the keyboard. Um, so that was kind of cool, I thought. And that was actually when I finally realized that these games that I played were also, were also something I could probably make one day. 
just a show of hands, how many of you got into programming because of video games, one, one, one way or another? A lot of people. I kind of suspected that was the case. I didn't think I was an anomaly in that case. And I mean, I had, I had computers growing up, and I mean, I was surrounded by technology. I grew up with this stuff, right? So I felt reasonably competent. Um, and uh, then I ended up building my first computer right around the time, a couple years after I got out of high school. How many of you have built a computer before? Most of you. Okay. So then if you're like me, and this isn't my computer, but this looks, and that's not my fingertip over there, but this is almost exactly what I had to build. It was a dual P2. And the thing about building a computer is it's not really that hard. It's actually uh, basically like putting together a jigsaw puzzle, except that the jigsaw puzzle is comprised of pieces that cost hundreds of dollars. So the problem with that is, if you're me, and you have a limited earning potential at this point in your life, is you're stressing nonstop, probably sweating all over the motherboard and everything else as you're assembling it. So that's fun. It's not, nothing, like, nothing like sweating all over the thing to uh, help electronics. I think moisture is good for them, right? And I really, really stressed when I was putting this thing together. I spent, I don't know, half an hour or so plugging everything in, checking everything, making sure everything was just right, because I was terrified that the first time I press the power button, it's going to explode. And I had it in a full tower case, because that's how I roll. Never mind, I couldn't lift the thing. But half the thing part way up, help get some help to slide the thing onto a desk and press the power button and absolutely nothing happens. I mean, I was mortified. I was like, this is, this is absolutely horrible. This is not going as planned. So I checked and rechecked everything and I started unseating memory and plugging things back in, reseating the CPUs and everything else. And uh, this is 15 minutes or so go by of this and I found the problem. Does anybody care to guess what the problem was? As it turns out, in order to power on a desktop computer, you must first plug it in. So I learned this, and I guess, I guess my takeaway is that sometimes when you're immersed in stuff, when you really, really think you kind of have all the, all the easy stuff covered, you miss the easy stuff. So sometimes, and you'll thank me for putting this on two slides because I know you'll want to taunt me later, I am an idiot. <laughs> and I would go so far as to say that Sometimes, maybe you guys are idiots too. Now, I think most of the time you're smart and also you're very attractive, so, so there's that. But, but I think that we have a tendency, uh, whenever we think we sort of know what's going on and uh, think we sort of have the answers, to make some bad assumptions. So we say, uh, oh, you know, this is, this is definitely how someone is gonna use my app or this is how someone, you know, how I'm gonna live my life. We just assume that it's gonna work out and sometimes we skip steps. Now, in programming, we have a technique that we use um, to avoid making assumptions, making bad assumptions, and skipping steps. What is it that we tend to do as programmers? Right, we do, we do TDD, right? So we go through this red-green refactor process where we describe what we want to do, and then we see whether or not we're doing it, and then we make it better, right? And it seems to me strange that we're so good at doing that whenever we write code. I mean, we are test obsessed in a lot of cases. But when we live our life, we don't sort of set up goals in the same sort of way and kind of be really intentional about it. So I've gone ahead and written a spec here. Um, and uh, there's, I don't know, what do you think? Is that a good spec? Is that a, does that cover a lot? If maybe you don't like specs. That's okay, I've got mini tests for you too, if you prefer. Um, <laughs> So I, I think this spec and this test suck. I mean, this is a horrible test, right? It's either, it's either all or nothing, right? It doesn't, it doesn't split things down into something granular that you can kind of approach in a, in a sensible way and begin to, to get a sense of whether you're heading in the right direction. So let's go back to red, green, refactor for a second and think about it. So what is red, really? Red is making it clear. Red is making it clear what it is that you're trying to accomplish, right? Green is making it real. So you've set expectations, now you make reality line up with the expectations in some way. And at the refactor point, you're trying to improve it in some way, you're trying to make it better. So I guess we should probably define what better is before we move forward. And given the title of the talk, I'm gonna hope that uh, better means it's more conducive to your own happiness. So before I ever actually submitted this talk, I started sitting down and, and writing out huge lists of things that I thought made me happy. Um, and I mean, I ended up with dozens and dozens and dozens of things. 
and kind of started categorizing them, kind of figuring out, you know, well, can I find any common thread here? And uh, then I decided, maybe, whenever I got the talk acceptance anyway, I should probably do some research because maybe I'm supposed to actually know about this stuff. So I went to Wikipedia and I learned a little bit of what Wynn described earlier, which is that is an endless, endless journey. Um, turns out psychologists are really interesting, by the way. So brief aside, psychology, they always used to approach things uh, using a disease model. So, so what that means is, let's say, let's say they're trying to make you less bad, right? They're not trying to improve things. So they're trying to take you from, let's say you're a, a negative six on a scale. They want to bring you to a negative two and say, that's a win. Awesome. You are now like a negative two where you were really, really unhappy before. And then uh, this, this movement called positive psychology got started. And they started to say, well, there actually might be some way that we can take people uh, and bring them maybe into positive numbers in terms of their overall happiness. We could use psychology to actually you know, improve their life as opposed to just make it suck less. And that was, that was pretty interesting. And one of the guys who is a pioneer of that movement is uh, Dr. Martin Seligman, who is actually like 70 years old now. But when I found this photo of this dude, I mean, this is a guy that knows how to have fun right here. <laughs> so, so Marty, I'm going to call him Marty. I hope that's OK. Marty, Marty had this whole, this whole theory. Um, and he's been working on it for years. I mean, the guy's been doing this, I think, for the past 15 years or so. And uh, one of the interesting things is that he said that happiness is uh, one of the aspects, right? Uh, positive emotions, right? But that all these other things, engagement, we call that flow. It's whenever you get engaged in some kind of a challenging activity that also happens to be enjoyable. Um, relationships, meaning, achievement. He, he took all of these things and basically said, they sit alongside happiness, but they're not happiness. And I kind of I get that, right? Like meaning is important. But I think that when you or I talk about happiness, um, we lump a sense of meaning into that. We lump uh, you know, a sense of achievement into that. Those things tend to improve our overall happiness. And so I got, I got pretty bored um, with, some of this, with some of this research. And I, I mean, I started watching. I watched Marty's videos. He had some really interesting videos. He's given talks at TED. You really should go look him up. He's an interesting dude. But I just really, I, I just, the more I dug into it, I started to think, gosh, this is, this is going nowhere. And I need something that can really help me help me kind of get through this in a way that I can apply it to my life. And this just didn't strike me. I mean, very academic. I mean, granted, the dude's a PhD. He should probably approach it academically. But I wanted something I could apply to my life. And so as I got through this boredom, um, I finally came back to my original list. Uh, that's my favorite, too. Um, I came back to my original list. And my original list, this is my version of everything Marty had to say, basically. Happiness comes down to three aspects. Resources to do stuff, stuff to do, and people to do stuff with. And that's it. Those three things. And you may think, oh, no, I have this other thing, right? Like maybe I really enjoy having nice art on my walls. But that's an activity. You want to look at the art on your walls. Or you want to be able to tell your friends that you have the art on the walls. Like that's very classy, right? So. Then I decided that since PERMA was cool and I was able to remember PERMA, that I should probably come up with an acronym or maybe a picture or something to give us mnemonics. So because I love you all and because you gave me hugs, um, I gave you not one but both, a picture and an acronym. It's CAR and it's the freaking Batmobile. It's not just any car. So you're going to remember it, the original Batmobile. So. And what CAR stands for is uh, capacity, activities, and relationships. And it just bundles down to those same three things I just said. Capacity, resources to do stuff, activities, stuff to do, and relationships, people to do the stuff with, right? Because when it comes back down to it, you know, at, the, at the end of our lives, we're going to look back on the things that we did. We're going to look back on the activities that we engaged in. And we're going to say, had a good life, I hope. I mean, that's the goal. So this is, this is my theory, but I am going to let Marty ride shotgun, and you, you definitely should check, out, should check out some of his stuff as well, because he's a smart dude. It just, it just wasn't working for me. So I want to drill in and talk a little bit about capacity. So first off, you, know, you need time and money to be able to do something. Um, and I want to, before I go any further, 
people say time is money all the time, and it, it, it it's really, really aggravates me because they are so incredibly different. I mean, yes, you can trade time for money in certain ways, but the exchange rate is so different depending on the person that you're dealing with. And you can't really get more time. You have the same 24 hours in your day, but you may have plenty more money. So it's, it's one of those things that I think anyway, it's really, really important to guard. I, I'm super protective of my time. Not that I don't waste it, but I waste it on my terms. And uh, <laughs> so physical capacity on the flip side, um, you have physical and mental capacity. Physical capacity would be uh, you're probably not going to start doing mountain climbing without having trained first. So, you know, if you're physically exhausted, you're not going to be able to go out and have a good time, even if, in fact, you have the time and the money to do so. Um, on the activities side, um, they can be fun, they can be challenging. These are obviously a non-exhaustive list, right? But the idea is you may get one or more of these, hopefully all of these, in one single activity, in which case you're going to check off a lot of boxes in terms of making yourself feel overall happy. Um, and on the relationship side, um, you know, you have family, you have friends, you have uh, professional and romantic relationships as well, and the potential for those things, right? Um, that is what maybe gets you out of bed in the morning, right? Like, oh, I might make a great, awesome networking connection today, or I might meet the man or woman of my dreams. Um, so I think of these things a lot like, if you're familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Um, he says that you have to have so much of one thing before another thing becomes relevant. But in general, you get diminishing returns once you end up uh, getting to a certain level in any, given, in any given one of these things, physiological needs, safety needs, and so forth. So physiological needs, something like food, for instance. If you don't know where your next meal is going to be coming from, you're probably not going to be on the esteem part of the ladder worrying about just how you feel or what you've achieved today, because you don't know where you're going to eat. On the flip side, you don't have to be eating filet mignon every single night before you start worrying about safety and whether or not somebody's going to break into your house and murder you in your sleep. So I guess I would say that in a similar way, you should be looking for trade-offs among the things that we talked about earlier in terms of resources and, and, uh, and uh, the activities uh, that you might want to do and start to be intentional about the choices that you make. That's really what Red Green Refactor is all about. It's about making choices and then going and following through on the choices. It's not just letting life happen. It's not writing that one spec that says life should be awesome and then checking every day and saying whether or not it was. That's going to require one important thing, which is that you run your specs or tests, you know, whatever. And uh, for me, you know, in my life, that that's generally happens. It's a, it's a point of reflection, right? It's what am I thankful for in the day um, and what am I... What am I maybe unhappy about or worried about? What is, what is the stuff that would be a, considered a, a net negative on the day? For me, that happens when I pray. For you, it might be when you medit after you've meditated or uh, just on a time of reflection, you have a long drive, you're just kind of chilling out, listening, like listening to nothing except what's going through your head. And uh, I would say that you, you need to take the time to do that. You need to make the time only because if you don't take the time to reflect on this stuff, then it's the same as writing a great test suite and then never bothering to run it and check where you are on, on the, uh, the achievements. So before I go too far into some of the things we might try to do to check off some of these boxes and the, the metrics that we've set up, you know, now we have metrics, so let's start figuring out how we, can, uh, how we can begin to meet them and raise them. Exercise, nutrition, and sleep. These are huge. See what I did there? Um, if you, these three things, these three things are actually going to help you in basically every other area that you try to work on. So, and, and if you could, if I can veer off topic for a second, I guess I can, I've got the mic. Um, exercise out of the three, if you can only pick one, do that one. Because the other two are going to naturally follow, and I learned this firsthand. Um, in fact, a lot of the stuff here, um, going back to the I am an idiot thing, uh, unfortunately, uh, I've learned a lot of things by doing them wrong. And if intelligence is learning from your own mistakes and wisdom is learning from the mistakes of others, I've heard that before, then you guys are going to leave here so freaking wise. Um, exercise, if you do it, is going to, first off, make you physically exhausted and going to aid you if you're not sleeping well or whatever. You're going you're to want to get good sleep. The other thing is, is that 
I started to realize after I started exercising that all of those people giving me all of that nutritional advice weren't actually full of it. Like once I started to, <laughs> Joe knows what I'm talking about. It's like once I actually started to exert myself, I started to care a lot more about the kind of fuel that I was putting in my body because I felt like complete crap if I didn't. And so it gave me motivation to take care of myself better. Um, so after we've got those out of the way and we just know that those are things that are gonna increase our capacity to do other things, then we would start to look for things, you know, the holy grail of optimizing for happiness would be stuff that really meets at the intersection of your relationships, your activities, and your capacity. If there's something that can have a positive influence or a negative influence, then you should be very carefully uh, focused on, on that, particular, that particular thing because it's going to have a drastic impact in your overall level of happiness. And as it turns out, there is one thing that comes to mind immediately that has a drastic impact on all of those things. It's location. Where you choose to live your life is going to have a drastic, drastic uh, effect on just about every other aspect of your life. So do you guys remember these? I loved these things when I was a kid, the spot the difference things. And I know at least two of you have probably already started looking. That's not what I'm going to, the general idea, right, is you see two pictures, they're subtly different in some way, and you start to find the differences, and you know, you feel really full of yourself whenever you find out you got them all. And I want to play that game with you real quickly. Here are two code samples. They both do the exact same thing when they run them, but one's subtly different than the other. Can you spot the difference? I'm going to give you a second. Maybe take a drink. Right, so the difference is the one on the left was coded in Louisville and the one on the right was coded in San Francisco. <laughs> right, that really wasn't fair, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm completely trolling you. Here, I'll give you another one. This one's a little easier. Okay, spot the difference. In this case, I think it's probably a little easier. Throw you a slow ball. And, uh, you know, this is, I'm not picking on San Francisco. I know we have Yammer folks out there, and San Francisco's great, and it might be for you. But for me, personally, when I started to look at the cost of living for some of these, uh, some of these jobs that I was being recruited for, I had a really hard time justifying moving somewhere, moving my family. I mean, I, I live directly across the road from my kid's school, which is huge, by the way. I mean, like, in terms of convenience, it's hard to get better than that. There are things like that that I just, you know, I would be loath to give up to, to go spend that much, 645%. And I want to make, make a point, too, because for some reason, math is hard. Um, this down here, 136% more expensive is not 36%, like, more, it's actually over twice. When they say more expensive, it's not 136% of the amount. It's increased by 136%. That's a drastic difference. And the thing about it is, your physical location, I've got a handy chart here of the things that we talked about before. Let me just go ahead and tick off the, the aspects that physical location actually covers you know, in your life. It has impact on all of these things. It has impact on how far your, your, your money is going to go. It has impact at the macro level, like if you, in terms of uh, cost of living that way, but also at the micro level. If you choose to move to a neighborhood that's closer to where you work, if you do work in a physical location that you have to be, then it has impact on your time. Um, and all of these other things. I mean, you, you're probably not going to do much scuba diving if you live in Kansas. So, you know, if you are big into scuba diving, maybe you want to go somewhere where they have a little more water and so forth. Now, here is the impact of physical location on your value to an employer. That's, that's it. It's a handy chart, I think. Now. Now, I, I will admit that's only for qualified employers, right? And what do we mean by qualified? Well, you're probably going to have objections as soon as I say this. And there's, uh, I know that there are a number of people who work for enterprise companies out there right now. So I want to I wanna apologize in advance if you're like immediately red flags, like, no, no, you're all wrong. We'll get to that in a second because I'm going to skip it for now. Um, I did some, some research. And uh, not too long ago, the US Census Bureau came up with some really in interesting t t statistics, right? Um, I want to look at this for a second. Now, this is times 1,000, right? So there are over 3 million poor schmucks in this country that are spending 90 plus minutes commuting to work one way. They're giving up 
at minimum, three hours of their day in order to get to their job. And I started pulling out a calculator and adding up some of these numbers, and over one in three people, I don't know if that's the case for people in this room or not, I'd be really curious actually, how many of you um, spend at least, uh, at least a half an hour in a commute to your job? Wow. That held up almost perfectly true. That's like one in three of you. Um, I expected that for some reason to be lower in the development uh, business. And I think partly because, you know, if you think about it, you know, where, where is it that you really want to be? For me, it certainly wasn't in a car or on a bus or on a train, you know, for, a, for at least an hour of my life every day. Think about it. That's, Let's say you have an 18-hour day. You're spending over 5% of your day getting to where it is you want to be. And life is just too short to spend so much of it in between the places you truly want to be. So there are two ways to approach this, right? And it comes back to the experience uh, matching up with or your expectation matching up with your reality, right? Um, you can either shift your expectation and try your darndest to, to make better use of the time. Like say you have a long commute, make that the time that you reflect on your day. Make that, make that useful to decompress as you come home from work or something like that. Find a way to be happy with it so that it is where you want to be, or you change something about, about your situation. So I mentioned we would get back to some objections you might have about my, my assertions regarding physical location and uh, whether or not you can work remotely. So the impetus for this talk was really um, a blog post that I had written a while back and submitted to Hacker News. And as you might imagine, me making the assertion that I would rather live in Louisville than San Francisco didn't go over too well with the startup <laughs> crowd. Um, there were actually some really supportive comments in there. My point wasn't that everybody should move to Louisville, though you, you totally should come visit sometime. I have an extra bedroom. It's fine. Um, my, point was that, my point was that you should be able to find what works for you dictate how you want to live your life, where you want to live your life, and then once that really big decision is made, start to work out all the other stuff, because the other stuff is small. The other stuff is really little. And so the top rated comment on the, uh, the Hacker News uh, posting for this, this article, I'm only gonna read a part of it, because we'll get to the rest of it later, but the single biggest problem with working remotely is that you have to be excellent at a lot of things that don't matter when you're on site. And since your energy is a zero sum game, being excellent at these things steals energy from building. So the really cool thing is there's 10 bullet points here. Bullet points are great because you can refute them in a very systematic way. Um, <laughs> I went ahead and split these two, bullet, these two sets of bullet points into two groups. Two groups nicely matched up at five. We're gonna label the first one wrong. And the second group is what is this I don't even. So working through these, we'll start with the, with the low-hanging fruit first. So apparently, um, there's, a, there's a common thought. And I, honestly, I do believe there are probably people in this room who, if you don't think this, your employer does, that you need to be excellent in dealing with conference calls and web-based meetings if you are working remotely. That's a non-issue because unless you only ever work with people that are in the same building as you, you never have any customers at all, which would suck to be you if you don't have any customers, you're probably going to have to deal with meetings in some way, shape, or form. And I doubt that every single prospect is going to come to your office to meet you. So I don't really, I don't see where that one weighs in at all. Now the other ones are kind of grouped up by two actually. So this building relationships without benefit of breaks and meals and understanding the human terrain, the human terrain. Who writes this stuff? Understanding the human terrain without benefit of gossip and the water cooler. Well, that's politics. And I would tell you this, if that is a significant portion of your job, if that is a significant thing that you have to focus on, your mental energy that should be spent on creating value for your employer and for your customers, run. Seriously, you're in a toxic environment. That is screwed up. And then as far as the last two, being noticed and recognized for who you really are by new people and being included when you're out of sight, out of mind. Well, that really smacks of insecurity to me because the fact of the matter is, is yes, you do, you do need to reach out and make yourself known, but you don't need people to be able to come up, like see you every day and come over and pat, pat you on the back and say, great job on writing that uh, CSV importer, Joe, or, or whatever. 
the, the general idea is that you should be able to do good work and then know how to push that information out there to the people that need to know. Now, as far as the wrong stuff up here, the interesting thing about this is preparing precise specs, interpreting precise specs, writing precise emails, inter it, he kind of stretched it out a little bit. Um, this is all really boiling down to written communication, which is seriously important. So why am I labeling it wrong? Because of this. Apparently, these things don't matter if you're on site. You shouldn't be good at written communication if you're on site. Just a bonus. So we've narrowed it down to written communication being one of the only valid things that, that was brought up here. And I've got a, probably something that's not going to be a lot of news to most of you, but programming is written communication. Think about it. When you write code, you're writing for one of the most inflexible, unforgiving, literal readers in the world. Mm -hmm. You're a compiler or you're an interpreter. But you're also writing for a future you, you're writing for your teammates, you're trying to reveal intent. Otherwise, we would all be unrolling our loops whenever we were writing our Ruby code, you know. We, we, we wouldn't bother, we wouldn't bother with uh, using a compiler at all. In fact, why not just write assembly? It's certainly very readable. Um, so the point is, is we, when we program, we are writing code, we are writing intention revealing documentation at the same time. Even if, even if we don't document our code, which hopefully you do, your code should be written in a way that somebody reading it gets a sense of your intent. Those people are gonna be reading it with certain assumptions or maybe picking up nuances and, and looking for intent. So programming is written communication. So then I guess if that's the case, then the single biggest problem with working remotely is that you have to be excellent. So, be excellent. Mm -hmm. Now, you guys are already taking steps in the direction because you're, you're standing here, or sitting here at the moment, in a, uh, in, a, in a conference designed to help you learn new things, right? You're already taking a step. Is there anybody here who, who doesn't want to be excellent? Go ahead and raise your hands if you don't want to be excellent. <laughs> All right, we have one. We have one underachiever. Um, all right, so you're gonna say, well, whoa, wait a minute now. I don't, I don't get this. I have rent to pay, I, I have a day job, I don't have time to go around working on my written communication skills when I work in an office full of people that already want FaceTime anyway, and they wanna deal with me face to face. I mean, what do you think? I, I, where am I gonna get this experience? It's not like I can just go out somewhere and just find this, this community that I can engage with and deal with in a way that would help me learn how to be part of a distributed team or anything. It's not like that kind of thing. Ex Wait a minute. Hold on a second. It does. Open source is exactly that. If you can manage to start an open source project and convince people who are not being financially compensated to take part in your open source project and to contribute meaningfully and you can communicate with them in a meaningful way to achieve some end, then party on, dudes, because <laughs> you're, already, you're already being excellent. And I guess I should, probably, I should probably stop there for a second and say, if you aren't able to maybe start your own project, at least go find someone else's project to contribute to. Ask them what they need. Communicate with them about what it is you'd like to have on the project that they're working on, and then see if you can collaborate with them in some way. This stuff works, it really does. If you don't know how to work on a distributed team, you will learn very quickly if you start to participate and contribute to open source. It's an extremely valuable <laughs> thing to be able to do. So, code is not your product. I don't wanna make it all about code, right? Um, in fact, you are your product and everything you bring to the table, including the written communication skills. And I, if you are your product, I guess that also makes you your product manager. That's really cool, because product managers get to decide what the feature set is. So you get to determine, you know, what is it that I'm gonna learn today? What is it that I'm gonna, gonna start to offer to my potential uh, employers, my current and future employers? Um, you get to decide where your services are located, right? And if, if that doesn't work out, it seems to be strange that that employers oftentimes seem to exert so much control over where we get to live our lives. I have another question for you. Um, how many of you have been approached with some reasonable semblance of 
interest in a, in a job offering in the past six months from a recruiter or any, either internal or external recruiter. All right, we got about half of them. Keep your hands up for a second. Um, three months. Past month. Most of the hands are still up. So it, I just have a question then. If it's that much in need, if our skill set is that much in need, wh why is it that, that someone is going to dictate to us where it is we need to be located in order to actually do our jobs? Why would an employer who wants to get the best candidates say, we only want the best candidates if they either live or are willing to live in this sphere that is approximately 25, uh, 25 uh, miles in diameter around our office? That doesn't make sense. That's not good business for the employer either. So then you have the power. I want to I wanna stop here for a second because this was work right here. There's, some, there's a site. You guys remember color forms, right? The things where you put the most... There's a site called the Cartoon Doll Emporium where I actually painstakingly assembled the He-Man and She-Ra that you see before you. So because I love you, this is what you get. So I don't really know how this happened, how this... this, this this power kind of flipped around and, and we, gave it, we gave it to the employers to dictate such big things to us about like where we live. But uh, I think it probably came from, you know, my folks grew up with, with, with parents uh, and in a family that, that had been through World War II, right? And I think at some point, you know, when you look back at, at their generation, there was a significant, um, there was a significant portion of the population that had a good shot at doing some kind of hard manual labor and eventually, eventually retiring uh, with a pension from their company. Now, that's, that's really good and I'm glad that they were able to do that, but that's not the world that we really live in today. And the past couple of job changes that I've made have almost invariably been towards smaller companies. I, uh, I used to work in the cable industry, which uh, was uh, interesting. We can talk later. But the thing about it was when I, start, when I moved out of the cable industry and I, I called my folks to tell, me, tell them, I have this great job and it's way more in line with what it is I want to do with my life. They said, are you sure? That was their first response. And it was, I mean, you, know, you saw my mom, she's a sweet lady, right? So she, wasn't, she didn't mean anything by it, but the, the fact of the matter is she, didn't, um, she was worried for me. She thought I was giving up some kind of uh, security that I had had by having worked in this job for, for seven plus years. And... Uh, I'll admit that this one's not really technically related, but my inner eighth grader had to include this, this, uh, <laughs> this poster. I apologize if you don't have an inner eighth grader. Um, and so somewhere along the line, somewhere along the line, we, we decided that um, we were going to team up with management, right? And that management was going to lead us, lead us into the future, and we needed to follow them. And maybe eventually, one day, we could be managers too. <clears throat> I'm not sure where that, and also, what is it with these old posters and why do they write like who people are on their butts? This is like, this is always the, all the old cartoons I have ever seen, that if they need to illustrate, I don't know if they think we're that dense or the plans for the future, opportunity, you know, okay, whatever. I'm getting off topic here. So it really came down to uh, the idea that I had job security. And I believe that job security is a myth. I believe that anywhere that you're going to work, you're going to sign an employment at will agreement. What essentially is going to say that you can leave anytime you want and they can let you go anytime they want. And I think that's fine. I don't think that, it isn't that employers don't mean well. An employer may have a very good intention of, of letting you stay with them until, until you're old and gray, but that employer may not be around in five or 10 years. So you have to invest in yourself. You have to spend time looking at what it is you want to do and building those skills because it's going to make you happier in the long run. That's what job security looks like. And the thing about job security is, you know, our, our brains love it because if we feel like we have job security, then we can kind of coast a little bit. We can relax, get comfortable. Um, it's kind of neat to be the, the smartest guy in the room, and I'm the one with all the answers, because I've been here for 15 years, and I know how this obscure thing that I planted some obscure code in so that I would continue to be able to work here for 15 years uh, works. There was actually a guy um, that, uh, that I knew of that had, uh, that had a notebook full of, he, he basically put garbage, 
garbage variable names in all of his code, and then had a notebook with translations for all of that stuff once upon a time. So, you know, fine, whatever. A while back, you guys know what Hungry Academy is? Living Social, I'm gonna talk it up a little bit again. Hungry Academy was freaking awesome. I got to work with some of those guys. And uh, the thing that we did was we ran a five-month course, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, we turned people that either were programmers but not necessarily web developers or had no experience at all developing, we turned them into developers. And uh, before I ever started working at Living Social, uh, Jeff, uh, who was leading the, uh, leading the Hungry Academy students, asked me if I would Skype with them and do a little chat. And he surprised me midway through the, to the talk that I was giving to him and said, if there were one thing that you could, you could ask uh, these people, these students, tell them that they should learn, you know, what was it that you would, you would tell them you'd want them to take away? And I thought, wow, that's no pressure, one thing, huh? And I don't know where this came from, but this is what I told them. I said, strive to feel stupid. And a few months later, after I took the job with Living Social, I decided I would probably do well to buy a book by Chad Fowler called The Passionate Programmer and read it, since he was going to be my VP. And uh, turns out I'm in good company. He says, be the worst. Uh, he has an old chapter called Be the Worst. And I think we talked about that just a couple of talks ago. Um, if you're feeling stupid, and I note, I'm not saying strive to be stupid, I'm saying strive to feel stupid, there's a difference. But if you feel stupid, if you feel stupid, you're stretching. You don't want to be comfortable. You want to be, you want to be in a situation where you feel that you're growing. And I don't know about you guys, but for, for me, if I'm not actually growing, I start to feel like I'm getting dumber like every day. I just, I, I get rusty. I, I forget how to do things. I wrote an iOS app like two years ago. I haven't written any iOS stuff in a while. And I, if I went back to it now, I would be like, what? This is, it's important to keep stretching yourself. I, uh, I like, I got this from, from Quora. An anonymous user um, posted the answer to this question, what's it like to always be the smartest person in the room? It's my favorite way of stating this ever. It sucks. It means you're in the wrong room. Find a room you can be in where you're going to learn. Don't mean a, it can be a campfire room or an IFC room. I don't mean that it has to be a physical room that you sit in with your coworkers. But you do need to find a way to stretch yourself. So in case you haven't noticed, I'm going through a big list of mistakes I've made. Um, here's another one. Uh, I've found myself in past, past salary negotiation positions where I've, I've, uh, I've thought to myself, gosh, if they just gave me X amount more than what the offer is, this would be a no-brainer. If you're in a situation where the money is the thing that's really going to put you over the top to take a position, it should be considered, if not a red flag, at least a yellow flag. The thing about it is, is this. If you're actually, <laughs> if you're actually uh, going to take the job because of the money, there's this thing, have you guys ever heard of the hedonic treadmill? So the hedonic treadmill, it's another one of these things they, they've espoused in, uh, in uh, positive psychology. But the hedonic treadmill, the idea is that you have a tendency to be, to trend toward a, cert, toward a certain level of happiness. So you might get a salary boost for a little while, but what's gonna happen is that your lifestyle is by all likelihood gonna expand to fill that salary, right? And so then what ends up happening, and this is the weird thing, is that if you think about it that way, by taking that job that only led you toward, you know, led you toward taking it because of the extra salary, once you get comfortable with that, with that salary level, that part of the happiness goes away. Now, I'm not talking if you're in poverty. I mean, if you're in poverty, by all means, put food on your table. You know, take a, take a good job. I don't think I'm talking to people. We're software developers. I don't think we're struggling that way. Um, but if you're taking, if you're taking a job for a salary boost, and then you end up in that situation where you're now back at that normal level of happy, and that's all you had to show for it was the salary, well, then what did you really gain? In, in a lot of ways, you've actually, and this is counterintuitive, you've actually reduced your opportunities in the future because now, in order to maintain, maintain that same level of happy, you're gonna need to find a job that's willing to pay you that same amount, even if it maybe is not a job that would be your cup of tea otherwise. And this is the one I really struggled with. Um, I can't tell you how many times in jobs that I've said, I am going to really miss all the people that I work with. They are the best people in the world, and 
I really love him and I'm sorry I have to leave. But as much as I wish that it could be, I mean, you know, sometimes Superman has to go back to Krypton and stuff. And, you know, then where are the rest of the super friends left? Um, I, think it's, I think it's really important to remember that while working with great people is an awesome bonus, if you make it the main driving factor for taking a position with another company, you may be left in a situation where supposedly these people whom you really like, you want them, right? You, if you like somebody, you want them to do what's best for them. You want them to do, do the things that are going to help them be more happy. What if that thing means that they go work somewhere else? Then you're going to be left in a position where it's going to be awfully difficult for you to be happy for them and to be supportive of them. And newsflash, they don't have to work for the same company for you to continue to be friends. I've got plenty of friends that have left companies or that are with companies that I left before. It's not, it's not necessarily important that you like everyone you work with. And you guys are a likable bunch anyway, so you're going to make friends wherever you go. See how this, this works, this buttering you up thing? Totally going to give you a speaker rate link later. Um, so why is all this important? And I'm running out of time, but <sighs> optimizing for happiness to me is really super important because the job that we do, I mean, we get to start with a blank text editor and we get to create just about anything. Anything that we have in our mind, we can create. It can be a beautiful something. It can be a functional something. It might even be a world-changing something. And from the time I was six, I knew I wanted to do this with my life. And I want to be able to do this with my life until I'm too old to be able to see the screen. And by then, who cares? Because we're going to be like wet wired anyway. <laughs> and if that's going to happen, in order for me to keep on doing this thing that I love so much and that I feel gives me a chance to have a creative outlet and also put food on the table at the same time, then I need to be happy. I need to be happy because otherwise I'm going to get drained by all the bullcrap that we deal with whenever we have to deal with stakeholders that don't understand or whenever our internal customers just simply don't seem to really understand why we're telling them that they need um, you know, a two-week two lead time if they ask us for X, Y, or Z. That stuff can be draining. You need to find a way to be happy. And so I guess I'm back where I started in that happiness really is like that power cord. It's what allow, allows you to continue doing what it is that you love to do. So don't forget to plug in. Thanks.